This episode of SMA's Fireside Chat was filmed at the Landpack Symposium. Right, so this is kind of a, an annual gathering of our allies and partners in the Pacific uh, where we really talk about some of those big topics that, you know, how do we uh, build sustain, uh, sustainment, logistics, um, force projection, things like that. And so in this conversation, what you'll see is actually between the 15th Sergeant Major of the Army, Dan Daly, and the 16th Sergeant Major of the Army, Michael Grinston, talking about what does NCO leadership look like um, when you're working with allies and partners and how do you advise some of those partners when they are talking about building a professional NCO core? Uh, and oh, by the way, you're doing that across the Pacific, which is a very, you know, it's a very distributed um, area of operations. So very interesting conversation and I uh, hope you enjoy. The theme for our forum today is the role of the non-commissioned officer corps in land power across the Indo-Pacific. And let me begin by welcoming our distinguished guests for the first person in this forum today, the 16th Sergeant Major of the Army, Sergeant Major of the Army, Michael Grinston, SMA. Awesome. Okay. Uh you know, if you know me, I'm always off script. I do want to recognize, I don't think we, we missed uh, the Singapore Sergeant Major of the Army, so thank you for being here too. I want to say thank you. That's awesome. Well, so I mean, welcome. It's always good to have you uh, here at the Association of the United States Army. And you've blessed our presence on many occasions. Um, you know, we, uh, we joke all the time, so ever since the first time I came here and SMA took over, we couldn't have a forum without talking about ACFT. And I promise <laughs> you, we are not going to talk about ACFT today. So I'm not. Gonna, well, I'm sure maybe the question will come up and you'll have to. Um, but we're going to talk about it. the role of the non-commissioned <laughs> officer. And SMA, I'd like to turn the floor over to you for a few open comments and uh, to address the group before we get into a fireside chat. And just a reminder, your questions, uh, both the microphone and we have Miss Christine in the back. She has question cards. If you'd like a question card, just please raise your hand. She will get those filled out. But you're also welcome to use the microphone and approach those to ask the SMA questions uh, at the conclusion of our chat. SMA? Um, I'm really uh, excited to be here, you know, especially as I, I got just a few more months left in the seat. And, and before I even start, I have to tell this story because you already introduced him as the Sergeant Major of the Army, uh, Paul. So, uh, and this may come out later. Paul is uh, a good friend and has been to my house. But unfortunately for Paul, he's like, hey, let's go run the Army 10 mile. I'm like, Paul, oh, sure. Uh, but Sergeant Simmons is coming with us, and she's a really good runner. So run 10 miles, and I think General Potter was outside the house, and she walks up, and Paul walks up and shakes her hand, and he goes, hi, I'm the Sergeant Major of the Army. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and she's like, I don't think that's you. <laughs> so, um, but with those opening comments and how you build trust um, you know, and just having wonderful group of individuals that I've worked with uh, throughout my career, and I've got many fond memories of different NCOs and different countries and building those relationships where we have these wonderful stories. I think that's what it really means to be in the military, and that's what's great about having this forum. Um, you can invite those people to your house and you'll build some relationships over time and it does take time and when I look about uh, around the room it, you you have a just this you know great wealth of knowledge and so that panel after this is going to be phenomenal. So I'm really excited to be here and I can't wait to talk about this topic uh, and I'm really proud to be with you today. It's awesome. Excellent. Well thank you SMA we appreciate you having with us. So Sergeant Major, you have experience in the Pacific. You know, you were previously a core Sergeant Major here. Uh, we'll talk about that. But our theme today is the role of the non-commissioned officer in land power in the Indo-Pacific. Um, how can senior enlisted leaders enable mission command across the Pacific and when it's geographically spread? How, how do we do that? Yeah. Uh, that's a very interesting question. When you talk about mission command, um, number one, um, I do want to caution everybody, um, you're not the commander. <laughs> so, I, and I really put that, and I usually tell all U.S. You know, Sergeant Majors, is start with that. And so, um, you're, how do you enable mission command? You're not the commander, and you're not, you don't have those roles and authorities. And when I look at my time as First Corps, how do I enable mission command? Well, you can be an enabler, you just got to be out there. And where do the, where is the commander? Do you always have to sit right there with the commander? 
um, you're probably not enabling mission command if you're sitting right next to your boss. That's especially in the Pacific. It's so large, so diverse, so many other places. You enable that, in my personal opinion, is sometimes you got to be where your boss isn't. What are those things that you can see that he or she can't see? And the higher you go, the harder this gets. Uh, I'm being honest with you. The chief, you know, he's he just it's been all over the. Uh, the Pacific, he'll see things, he'll talk to certain people, I'm going to talk to different groups. And that's how you enable the command, it's not by talking to the same people, You're, it's by talking to different groups. Well, you know, he'll, he's going to talk to the, the chief of defense or who's running, you know, the Philippine army or, or the, you know, whatever it is in that country, uh, and I'm going to talk to the soldiers. You know, and when he talks about, and he'll talk about things, if you've heard the chief talk about, it, he'll talk about, you know, capabilities. And then at the end, he talks about will. And when I go down and I'm looking at soldiers from whatever country, you know, I'll probably be looking for do they have the will to fight? And that's how I would enable my boss. It's not because I'm going to sit there and, and go everywhere they go. It's I'm going to go out and I'm going to check on our soldiers. Do they have the will to do exactly what we've asked them to do? And that's on one side. And then on the other side, you know, same thing with any country. Uh, they may have the, do they have the capabilities at the, the junior level? But also, do we think they have the will to fight? Because that's come up a lot in Russia and Ukraine. Yeah. Do they have the will? So that's how you enable it. Um, you take the commander's intent and see what they're trying to do in that operation and then go to a different level and say, hey, is that really what's happening at the lower echelons? Because what's happening up here and what's being said, and that's what uh, I found all across the Indo-Pacific, may not be what's happening at the ground troops. And that's what's great about, you know, Sergeant Majors. You can go see that. And, I, and that's just my opinion about that's one way to enable it. You know, you've got a lot of other people to help you do that. Um, and then having, you know, a network of within the U.S. Army. You know, you've got 8th Army. I think Rob Cobb. I've seen him. Sean Carnes. And how do you talk to them if you can't be there? And you get that feedback and you trust that they're actually telling you they've seen the ground truth in those areas. Um, so there's two ways. You personally by being out there in a different level, but it's also by enabling the Sergeant Majors in those locations. Uh, and what are they seeing? Absolutely. Sergeant Major, this morning General Flynn in the open forum talked about trust and how important those relationships are across especially a very dispersed uh, geographic area. So how do we, what does trust mean for the senior NGO population? How do we operationalize it across the universe? Yeah, well, that's a, a really good question. I actually had it in a, a, a leader forum just a few minutes ago. And the, the actual question was, um, you know, how do you, move, how do you view trust in a bilateral agreement? And then how do you do trust in a multilateral agreement? And what I said is, believe it or not, the, the larger that group gets, the harder it is. Um, I think with trust, it takes time. Uh, so that's, to really answer your question, to operationalize it, and I just use our group. Once a month, we're on a Teams call with the, you know, the Five Eyes. And if we, and, and I'm not, you know, trying to say that's all important, but if I say that's 100, um, do we have the same conversations? So the larger that group, the harder the trust is to build that deep relationship that comes with trust. Uh, because Paul and I have known each other the longest, and if Moo was here, same thing. If Moo called me from New Zealand right now and said, I need you to do this, if I had to buy my own plane ticket, I would go do it. I mean, a wonderful person. I'm, you know, been, that's the kind of trust you want. Um, and I think the larger that group gets, the harder it is. Um, you you want to kind of keep it a small, tight group that you say, hey, no matter what, when they call, I'm going to be there. Um, and that's how you kind of start to operationalize it. And we, we kind of figured it out. I think it was COVID. I think Gab started it, by the way. Um, and he said, hey, let's get on this phone call. We can't travel anymore. How do we build, keep those relationships up? Um, and we saw that we couldn't fly and see each other, so we started the Teams call. And that's kind of how we operationalized. How do we keep that open communication? Um, so when 
you need some help and what we found is that we all have the same problems. Uh, Jim's a little bit more unique up again. Sometimes he's like, we did this and we're learning a lot from them. It's like, man, hopefully we don't do that. But um, what I'm saying is you find ways to connect when you're talking about trust. It takes time. Sure. And that's the biggest thing, how I would say to operationalize trust across you know, a very large group of bodies of water and, and countries. It takes time. And then how do you find ways to connect routinely, not once a year at Yama Secura, not once a year at Lampac. It's those routine touch points. And I think when you get those touch points with those in your area, um, you'll start to build trust. Absolutely. It's unique that, you know, as you mentioned, you talk about um, bringing all the team together and you all have the same challenges and soldiers are really universally across the land are the same um, but being able to share the some of the solutions to those challenges in those forums I think helps build the trust and, and understanding that your your partners are both sharing the same experiences uh, and the same successes and know that they have each other's back SMA, you talked about at your level now as a Sergeant Major of the Army, but um, I want to uh, capitalize on your experience as the I Corps or the First Corps Sergeant Major as the I Corps Sergeant Major or First Corps Sergeant Major um, corrected me. Uh, this Dan, I, I don't say bad things about Fourth ID, yeah. so no, let's no, not no. go with this. I'm, I'm not. Okay. I'm not. Um, <laughs> but can you explain what it looked like from your position as the First Corps Sergeant Major, and then has it changed from then till now? Yeah, we were really good back then. Uh, yeah. I don't know what's going on now. <laughs> Maybe a little bit better. Yeah, they're, they're probably doing much better now. Uh, well, I tell you, yeah, it has changed dramatically. And I'll, I'll kind of tie this together. But, you know, at the time, you know, at the time when I was first corps, we still had the other two corps rotating in and out of Iraq. Um, so my time as first corps, you know, we kept doing these exercises. We try to figure out this thing called pathways at the time you know um i think it was general brooks i think came in and said hey let's call all these little exercises one big thing and tie them together um so we were trying to figure out what pathways was you know and and how that was how we were going to operationalize all the exercises and we called it a series of pathways so that was in you know it's in infancy at the time um but again we still have this other army thing going on called Iraq and these corps rotating in and out. Um, still had Afghanistan, uh, and then we had these exercises. So even though we said, um, "Hey, this is you know, this is the number one challenge. This is the pacing challenge in China, in the Indo-Pacific, and how do we put our resources in?" It? We kept, as an army, we kept being pulled away to these other things. So at the time, I had a, a deep connection, and hopefully he still does, with the, the Forces Command. That's usually the supplier for all those things outside of the Indo-Pacific. Um, but the, all the missions were still there. Um, and you know, you're still doing you know, Balakatan, Talisman Saver, all those exercises, but it was kind of overshadowed by what the, oh kidding, we're fighting and people are dying kind of moment. And now fast forward, like how does it change? Well, it changed a lot. Well, let's just see, and you, believe it or not, it was Europe. When Ru Russia invades Ukraine, in my opinion, that was like, hey, wait a minute. You know, these things actually could, this could, or could this actually happen in our, in our theater? I, I mean, would China actually do the same thing in Taiwan? And that's my opinion is that's how it's changed. It's like, well, wait a minute. Um, you know, believe it or not, that European theater, in my personal opinion, shaped more emphasis or over here. Or do we have the ammunition ready to go if this happens here? Do we have this? Are we do the Taiwanese have the will that we've seen uh, in the Ukrainian army? So we really started to look in this Indo-Pacific, and you know, First Corps was like, "Hey, what's what's First Corps doing?" <laughs> you know, it's like not that they forgot about me when I was First Corps, but it, it really has uh, all our attention because that's the Pacific. And then, are we putting the resources there? Um, and you've seen what we've already done. I mean, just look, we've renamed uh, the Eleventh Airborne uh, the division. And we give them people to actually have a division, you know. And most people don't realize that they had, I think they had 50 people in the headquarters. 
<laughs> so I, uh, I'm not sure what that, how's that to division, <laughs> but uh, but now um, now they have more people. We assigned it. We we're giving them the right equipment to fight in the Pacific, and that's how it's changed. It, it's it's not just us saying it's the Priority Theater. We are putting a lot of resources from the Department of Army there. Um, and more so than I think we have when I was the course art major. Absolutely. I just want to remind our honors to start thinking about your questions. I'm only going to ask a few more. I'm not going to um, totally take over the conversation here because I want to involve your questions to the SMA. We have them for a limited amount of time today. But before we get to the audience, SMA, a couple more. You talked um, greatly about trust at Echelon. But for all the non-commissioned officers who are not here today that are from you know, being televised in or on the internet and seeing this later on, is how important is it for our junior non-commissioned officers and our soldiers who work on these pathway missions throughout the theater to build trust at Echelon for them? Yes. Yeah. Um, normally, it's extremely important. I mean, it's, I would say it's the secret sauce in our army, um, this, this thing called trust. And, and there's two two types of trust, and normally we miss one. So normally when you hear this word called trust, uh, it's usually from, I would say, higher to lower. It's like, oh, you gotta trust me. Um, you know, you hear a platoon sergeant tell the first sergeant that, you know, why are you down here? You know, go away, just trust. Um, and, and then the other part though is the one most people forget about is the trust from um, subordinate to higher. <coughs> So you have to trust that my battalion, you know, Sergeant Major, my battalion commander, when given all the right information, are going to make the appropriate decision. And sometimes we don't think like, that. oh, you know, and, I'll, and the example I gave the, the forum was I had a brigade Sergeant Major. I said, I needed a staff sergeant for tasking. And he said, I don't have any staff sergeants. It's like, you don't have any staff sergeants in your old battalion. I knew that's not true, right? <laughs> so I, mean, I, I saw, I, you know, I see your man. Um, but what I talked about was that he didn't trust me uh, if he laid out all the reasons why I shouldn't pick his unit to take that staff sergeant, he didn't have the trust in me to make the right decision. Mm -hmm. And it was up to me as the brigade to fix that, not him. I had to say, here's how do we do this. Um, and, but going back to what I said is about the secret sauce in our army. And now I just speak to the US NCOs in the room. We have great authority because our officers trust us. Never lose that trust. It is fleeting and could go in a, in a second. And we are great only because our officers say, you have all this authority. And then go do that. You know, in the United States Army, I run the nominative program. I mean, I think the vice might actually sign the paperwork at some point. I know he does, by the way. <laughs> so, but, but I run it. That is trust. And that goes from the sergeant major of the Army all the way down to the sergeant. If we don't trust our NCOs to be good squad leaders, they're not going to be squad leaders. If we don't trust that the first sergeant can be a good first sergeant and he can't do what they're being asked to do, our officers aren't going to trust us. So every being of our culture in the United States Army that is foundational to our NCO Corps starts at the base of trust. You take that away, you do not have a strong NCO Corps because they don't trust that you're going to do the mission, no matter what. So I, I think that's the, it, it is, you know, vitally important to who we are as a United States Army, especially with our NTOs. And we were talking about this in the other room also about this trust. And I said, well, a lot of times NTOs in the United States Army, in my opinion, uh, talk to the wrong people. We love to talk to each other. <laughs> it's the same thing in the room. We're all in the same room. We're all NCOs. And I said, if you really want to start a program in a different country, we should start by talking to the leaders, the officers of that country, and said, do you trust your NCOs to execute a mission without you being there? And if you don't want that, then uh, you, know, you can go out and talk to the NCOs to your boo in the face, 
But if they don't want that, in my personal opinion, been around the world, if the officers from that country don't trust their NCOs, you're just going to be banging your head against the wall. Yeah. It's, uh, I don't know what to tell you. So that's been my personal experience. But the good news is there are a lot of countries that do. Um, but I'd ask us, um, you know, I just to remind us in the United States Army that this trust isn't forever. You got to earn that every day. Um, you know, you can't screw that up. Uh, but then in the, in the, you know, the greater picture of other countries, make sure that their officers, that's what they want for their army. If they don't, then you work within the means of what you got. But it, in my opinion, it all starts to trust. Yeah, very powerful message. I mean, it's spot on. And I know you focused a lot on our, our army, but uh, that's a universal message for our coalition partners because it, it, it's uniquely the same in every army. I mean, trust has to exist at Echelon um, in order for an organization to work. Um, and I think the most powerful thing you mentioned is that it's it's uh, it's not achieved, it's sustained. You got to work on it all the time. Yeah. That's me. I'm going to go off the subject of our uh, our Indo-Pacific focus here for a minute, um, just because uh, we always have the opportunity to have the SMA on the stage, and I know that there's a lot of questions out there that may not apply to our theme today, and that's okay. But you mentioned SMA, and unfortunately, we only have you for a few more months as our Sergeant of the Army. What, what, what's unfortunate or fortunate? I don't know whichever you want to go with. Dan. Unfortunately, yeah. Not. I think <laughs> unfortunately, we were blessed. She's like, yeah, get rid of that. <laughs> get rid of that. Guy. Um, we were blessed to have your leadership. But what, what, what's your focus as you continue to, to drive towards the, the end of this mission? Uh, everything. <laughs> yeah. there's, yeah. a, there's a long list. Um, and I, I want to be clear, I, I don't have a, like a running tally and a list that ends when I'm the Sergeant Major in the Army. I've said this multiple times, I'll, I'll keep saying it to the end. If the Army stops or there's something I wasn't going to, that I was doing that ends with me, I should never have been doing it in the first place. If it's not good for the Army, I should not have been doing it. Um, so that's, that's who I 100% believe that. And the second thing is, if, we, if Mike Weimer isn't better than I am, I have failed to do my job. Uh, if there is any dip in our, in our Army um, because I leave, I have failed um, as a leader in the United States Army. So I have a lot of things I'd like to achieve. What's great about our Army, if I'm doing what's right, then those things are going to get accomplished whether I'm there or not. We've set it on a path to get those things done. And yeah, there's a lot of stuff I'd like to yeah, get that done. Um, but uh, for everything that we've worked on, if it just ends and goes away and stops because I'm there, then I honestly, I believe that I should have never been doing it. Um, but there's some simple things. I want to really complete the Army Body Composition Program uh, and get that finished. We got the 540 Army Directive signed out. We're trying to get some other things. We're trying to bring back uh, Land Nav and our Basic Leader course. I'm going to rephrase that. We're bringing back Land Nav and our Basic Leader course. It's going to happen. It's already started. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it's coming. I don't know why we took it out, but you took it out. It's your fault. So <laughs> somebody has to be That's blamed. Right. In this group. Well, you, you gave me great comfort with your statement. My <laughs> yeah. success was yeah, yeah, if, yeah, if yeah, you yeah, were better than me. So yeah, there, you right, so. there you go. There you go. So there's a lot of things. Um, bringing uh, back some training back in our basic leader course. Some uh, not training. Um, taking them back to the field. We're going to bring uh, you know little things like sleeping back in the field. Uh, some of those a little bit more lethality um, back into the basic leader course. But I've got a laundry list of uh, stuff that uh, we talk about all the time. There's just a couple I just keep going like you know even on the modernization I know we got Brian Hester here um, we just shot the 6.8 rifle the next generation squad rifle it is really good um, you know I, I usually wear glasses when I'm shooting long range when I can shoot the 300 meter target uh, every time and it's really simple you've got the right rifle um, it's really good. And so um, what's coming out, just not um, from a perspective of what we're doing in the NCO Corps, but some of the lethality uh, from an AFC perspective on soldier lethality is, is really looking good. Um, so I'm really excited about all that. Excellent. All right, let's go out to our audience SMA. And uh, again, Christine, she has comment cards. If you don't want to walk up to the microphone, you can grab one of those from her. She will bring them up to me. Or please grab the microphone. And uh, I'll tell you, it always stands true. The first person asks a question these forums is usually the best looking, smartest person in the room. And I know we're not going to be failed today on that aspect. So who has the first question for the Star Major of the Army today? I think every room needs like a I Dave Bass. Best looking. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there you go. <laughs> Okay. Um, 
gentlemen, uh, Sergeant Major Richardson, 516. Can, can you take Richardson? like two steps yeah. forward because you're like behind a column of whatever? <laughs> yeah. I prefer not to use the mic, but um, for the audience. Um, but SMA, um, one of my questions is we talked about resourcing and for you know the Indo-Pacific and the role of the NCO. Um, a challenge I found here over the last two years is getting that senior NCO leadership. I have uh, spoke to HRC as well as our senior leaders, but it's not uh, the number of senior NCOs, it's more of the EFMP process. And my recommendation was if we could do the screening prior to the selection. So what's been happening is, for example, um, I have a unit in Japan that is one of six master sergeants and about to be uh, zero of six. Um, with that though, we've had some people come on the gains for inbounds but they fall off because they don't meet the EFMP criteria. Some of the challenges are because we go through other services, um, unlike Army, then they don't meet the criteria. So when we talk about you know, the Pacific being a priority theater and bringing resources here, um, what are some uh, things we can do to improve the manning and being able for the selection process, especially with ASCIM and EFMP? Oh. Okay. I think there's like eight parts to that question. <laughs> so, and I, I think, just give me a thumbs up if I answer them all, I guess. But because you, you did talk about the exceptional family member program and, and then talent. This actually came up at the pre-command cores is we could do that screening, but some people don't want us to. I'll, I'll, and I'll be very clear is that maybe um, you are you know, selected to be a battalion command team in the Indo-Pacific and your family doesn't, you know, pass the screen. You may want that assignment. And that's actually what came up. It's like, well, if I screen you all out, because, hey, you can't go to that. So that might be your dream job. I always wanted to do that. My family will stay because I always wanted to be in this. I want to be in Hawaii in that unit as a battalion commander, or sergeant major, or first sergeant, toon sergeant, whatever it is. So this has actually came up. Do we just screen everybody out? Nope, you can't go. Your family can't attend there. Um, so that's a, a caution we have is that that's why we put people on assignment and then we do kind of do the screening. What we have to do as an army is do better and faster at the screening. And so we have the enterprise exceptional family member program and what we're finding is is that people haven't put their families into the program. It's on the internet. It will actually, it's a web based that you can go ahead and apply and they, they will wait until they're on assignment and that slows it down. Um, so on the EFMP side, um, I would say it's a caution that we don't screen out. Uh, it's more of a screen that you can go to the assignment because some people may, I always wanted to go to that assignment. And then on the other side, you're saying all the resources in the Indo-Pacific to do everything. Um, that's hard, is that most people think the Army has unlimited funds, and we don't. Right, so we have to put things in certain places, and sometimes we can't give everything to everyone everywhere. And, and that's probably normally what happens on, depends on where you go in a priority assignment, says I can't build a hospital everywhere you go, so we're gonna have to make that a restricted assignment. Um, now, as for talent, your, your Sergeant Major, well, if it's in Korea, Rob, and both of the Sergeant Majors are right there, is we have to make sure that we incentivize those priority assignments so you do have talented folks there. We've talked about this in our, some of our solution summits and our manning, uh, especially when we looked at Indo, PACOM, or Korea, actually specifically, um, when we're looking at first sergeants and how do we get as first sergeants. So we said, we're gonna have more first sergeants come out of the Sergeant Major Academy. <laughs> so, um, it maybe didn't make all the master sergeants in the Sergeant Majors Academy uh, excited, but um, we wanted to train them to be Sergeant Majors, but um, we didn't have a requirement to fill those Sergeant Major positions, so we reprioritized that if they're going to, we want to have a higher number come out of the academy, they may not be selected for Sergeant Major, wanted them to go be first sergeants, and we'd put them over in Korea. Um, so giving them a, a really talented, seasoned master sergeant for some of those jobs that, you know, are in the Indo-Pacific. And that's, where, that's how we're looking at talent. But it's usually working with either the USERPAC, 8th Army, I know Jackie Love's in the back, so it depends on who you're looking for, and that's how we look at talent. Okay. So just the last part, SMA, so for the, we have personnel that want to come to, for example, Japan, but because they don't meet the screening, 
Um, so kind of like you, what you were saying about command teams, so there are seniors that are selecting it, getting on assignment, but then other services um, are doing the screening and they're not meeting the criteria, even if they're willing to leave their family back. So that's what we're trying to figure out a piece. And my, my battalion sergeant major there is working with the, the Navy facility there to ask those questions to see if we as an Army can screen them so they are able to fulfill that assignment and we have the senior population we need. Okay. Well, that's fair. I think what you're talking about is it's not really screening. It's, I think it's called that weird thing called leadership. That's kind of how I see this is that um, there's a senior sergeant major. He's around here somewhere. I'm not going to talk about him. Uh, he was told that he couldn't go on that assignment for exceptional family member. And that was inside. I think it might have been a joint base. I said, okay. And took a little leadership to make a phone call. So don't when you're looking at talent and if you feel like this is the right person and we even found in this case like they have the facilities and we needed to apply leadership and i'll caution you all is that on a grander scale sometimes we have this thing called policy and we don't apply leadership with it and i call that nothing so you can write all the policies you want and if you don't have a leader that's willing to take an action on the policy you'd actually do nothing um, so uh, when I found that you want to make up for if you got a person that really good person is the right fit going to the right location apply some leadership and we'll get them to the right spot SMA uh, we do have one written question from the audience that I didn't stage this and I opened with a joke saying that we've never had a forum without talking about ACFT so are you kidding me I don't believe we that. are oh, we're, that we're talking about it <laughs> <laughs> so uh, and I got asked this question uh, I thought this is trust into Pacific and, uh, uh, so. I, 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 I should give credit to the to the author of the question Paul, you gotta ask the question right after this that's right save us. Lieutenant Colonel McKenzie Kim. says is there any chance we can do the two-mile run up front the first event so you can get his legs warmed up before he has to do all the drags and things like that. No. No. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> oh, you want more than that? No. Yeah. <laughs> no again? All right, I think we have time. <laughs> so, it's one designed more. that yeah. way. One more uh, you know, it's for all the right reasons. Yeah. Is the reason we extended the time um, was because you do five events before you get to the sixth event being the run. So uh, it's designed um, to test endurance. And if you reverse that, and believe it or not, that was the same thing with the old APFT. You were not allowed to do the run and push up sit ups because your hip flexors on the sit up were actually stressed. And that's the why you had to do sit ups first and then do the run. So the science in, is a little bit behind it, not just the Sergeant Major Army told you no, or you can go with that. You got two choices. A, <laughs> there was some signs behind it, or B, I just told you no. <laughs> All right, final question. Go ahead. Uh, SMA, uh, Sergeant Major Bennett, I'm the Theater Information Advantage Detachment Sergeant Major out here in the Pacific. Um, so within the, the structure of the Army, you know, we really kind of put a focus on what you've talked about with leadership and trust and, you know, making soldiers into leaders. Um, but the simple fact is not every soldier is a leader. Uh, and with the technical structure of how we're going forward with a, a lot of our forces, you know, we've experienced a lot of loss of soldiers to the contracting side for the technical side of, of what we need for, you know, cyberspace, EW, uh, things like that. And as, uh, you know, the lead for information advantage, that's really impacting how we conduct business and how we spend money on the contracting force. Uh, has, has the Army at your level, or, or have you thought about, you know, looking at a more specialized function of, of NCOs that maybe aren't leaders, uh, just like some lieutenant colonels will never be battalion commanders, and they're great staff officers. There are some NCOs that are not great leaders, but are fantastic at the more technical side of what we need in the Army and how we progress for land power uh, here in the Pacific. Yeah, it's actually a really good question. Um, and yes, I've thought about it a lot. The Army had a model like that. And we used to have a spec, I think it went to seven, I may even went eight, I'm not sure. So we had that model, we got rid of it, and we're not gonna go back to that. Um, but the way I answer it is yes, kind of, but it's really tied to pay. I mean, we had some highly technical folks, and what I'd like to see in the future is that you come in and you do get this highly you know, specialized skill, but you may have steps in there. So you could say, hey, you're a, a, a 17 Charlie, a cyber warrior. You may not need to be, you know, the Surveys of the Army, but you know, you may want to be really good in your field and do we can we incentivize that through some pay? And I, I just want to remind everybody in the room that the nobody in the Army or DOD controls your pay scale. 
<laughs> so uh, that is uh, that is the responsibility of Congress. And I, I just, and I'm not influencing, I'm just informing is that if there were a recommendation is how we would look at how we incentivize those through pay so that you get somebody who's highly technical but wants to stay, but we can still somehow incentivize them through some pay scale. So if we just took away the rank and just made them a, you know, a specialist and let them stay longer, but they're really good, you know, but those highly technical fields are really usually really sought after. So that's how we really have to resolve this problem. And it's not just by changing the NCOs. I think you make a sergeant, um, you know, I, I don't see a need to make it spec, you know, spec five. Just make him a sergeant, give him, give him a little bit of leadership. You know, the lieutenant colonel doesn't have a different rank. You know, still look like a lieutenant colonel, um, but they may not be in charge of that. But there needs to be a pay incentive that goes along with that for those highly technical skills, and that's what all services have been looking at. And that's when you know, Sergeant Major Marine Corps, Chief Master Sergeant Bass, um, you know, the MCPON. We've all kind of agreed, and the way to go after that is called the Quadrennial Defense Review of Military Compensation. And hopefully, that what comes out of that is a recommendation to, to fix the skill. Okay. Thank you. Sir. Well, ladies and gentlemen, um, we were blessed to have you here for just a few moments. SMA has got a lot of things to do while he's here on the island because we've got a, a large organization out here that's working with our coalition partners to defend the freedoms and protect the liberties of both, both us and, and our coalition partners. So, SMA, thanks for blessing us for your time. Let's give the 16th SMA a big round of applause. Yeah.